Hello and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to our speaker for today and all our participants. I guess this is the new norm in how we greet everyone these days on virtual webinars as we have people tuning in from any part of the world. So again, good morning, good afternoon or good evening to you from wherever you are. I hope everybody is safe and doing well today. My name is Daniel Lee and I'm the Public Affairs and Government Relations Manager of the British Czech Malaysian Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to BMCC's webinar on cryptocurrency, doom or boom. Blockchain and cryptocurrency have become a phenomenal trend that has captivated the interest of investors. Today, we'll dive in deeper into understanding cryptocurrencies' existing concerns, challenges, and opportunities as a digital investment alternative. We are honored to have here with us today, uh, Mr. Arif Lee, the Business Development and Liquidity Lead at Luno Malaysia. If you have not heard about Luno, I'm sure Arif will walk us through a bit about Luno later on. I will not spend so much time to introduce him because I think he has on his slides as well to introduce about his background. But being an expert in this field, I believe Arif will be able to leave us with new insights and new views on cryptocurrencies amid this economic downturn. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules before we begin. So feel free to ask your questions during the session, but post them on the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will try to address all your questions uh, during the Q&A uh, session if time permits. So without further much ado, I would like to invite uh, Arif from Luno Malaysia to give his talk. Over to you, Arif. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, BMCC, for having me. Um, I think before we begin, um, I think uh, Daniel did mention something in terms of where everyone is. If you could please drop down in the chat box of where you currently are, uh, please uh, do that because I'd like to get some engagement going. Um, you know, ultimately, you're spending your, the first day of your week with me, uh, and I really appreciate that. So please let me know where you are. So June says she's in Malaysia. Okay, awesome, June. Where is everyone else? You get to see where everyone else is currently. Okay, I'm just gonna present my slides. Natasha says she's in KL. Okay, Jonathan says he's in Malaysia as well. Okay, so I think so far from the people who are a bit more perky this, this week, uh, they mentioned they are all in Malaysia. Um, so yes, uh, definitely thank you so much for spending your, your afternoon with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, but in terms of today itself, um, you know, um, I'm, you know, very, very much honored to be able to share something that uh, we feel uh, has kind of changed a lot of people's lives around the world. Uh, now, I know, you know, I'm going to be, it sounds like as though I'm going to be sharing some get rich quick scheme. Uh, you know, that's not the case. I think uh, recently there are a lot more reports of uh, cryptocurrencies as well as some other aspects of blockchain actually being able to um, support some people, especially in the Southeast Asia region. Uh, if you've been familiar with uh, what's happening in Philippines, obviously because COVID has been ravaging over there as well, um, but actually some of their citizens have actually um, decided to use uh, what they call play to earn games to actually be able to fend for themselves, right? To put food on the table. Um, so yes, uh, we definitely feel that uh, cryptocurrencies has the ability to do that based on specific uh, use cases and specific circumstances. Um, but in terms of today, you know, I will try my best to keep everything under an hour. There's a lot to cover, uh, but also just to manage everyone's expectations. Uh, today's session is very much going to be a foundational level, you know, a very bare bones basic, just to kind of get you started. And then after that, you can kind of explore. Um, although Daniel uh, said that I'm an expert, I'm still learning on a day to day. I've been at Luno for about two years now. Uh, and, you know, every day it's kind of a, a crazy kind of whirlwind roller coaster. Um, sometimes uh, we have to refer to Twitter. Yes, I said Twitter to kind of see what's happening in the space. And it's kind of uh, in real time, right? Um, over 240 characters uh, being able to kind of see what's happening in the space. Uh, so just a quick note about me. Uh, my name is Arif. Uh, I'm the business development and liquidity lead at Luno Malaysia. Um, as I mentioned just now, I've been here for about two years. I've uh, been in crypto about two and a half years, at least in a personal capacity. Um, and yeah, so eager to kind of share with all of you in terms of what we have to, to cover today itself. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, Daniel already mentioned, but 
um, you know, in terms of if you have any questions, feel free to kind of engage with us in the chat box um, as well as the, the Q&A later. So if you have any questions, just drop them down below. If you want to share some sentiments or statements on crypto blockchain, feel free to do so at the same time. Uh, and then after three sessions towards the end, we'll be basically doing the Q&A itself. So um, don't feel uh, as though I'm ignoring you. You know, if you have any questions that you've already dropped down in the chat box and I haven't got to yet, we will actually do that at the end of the session. But doesn't mean that I've forgotten or we will not actually uh, be uh, discussing them, right? So towards the end, we'll do the Q&A itself. But um, most importantly, um, as with any particular talk on uh, financial uh, literacy or I guess anything covering finance itself, because I am uh, not a certified financial planner, this disclaimer has to be there. So it's very important to kind of just let everyone know that uh, today's session is very much not investment advice. Any content that we kind of discuss today or is presented as part of this webinar is purely for informational and educational purposes only. It cannot be treated as a recommendation or advice that guarantees your trading profit or loss. Uh, and then each customer who actually uh, interacts with Luno's platform is basically fully responsible on the decisions that they make using their own personal accounts. Any profits or losses that occur as part of this webinar are beyond Luno's responsibility and control. Okay, now we've got that out of the way. Um, what is Luno? So uh, for some of you who may not be familiar, um, Luno very much is a platform that makes it safe and easy for you to buy, sell, and learn about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other uh, approved cryptocurrencies, at least specifically in Malaysia itself. Uh, we're the first digital asset exchange in Malaysia uh, that is regulated by the Securities Commission. Uh, our headquarters are actually uh, based in London. Uh, we were actually founded in Singapore and our founders actually have roots in South Africa. So yes, we are kind of like all over in the world, you know, in terms of uh, where we were founded, uh, where we're currently uh, headquartered as well as um, where the company kind of has its roots. Um, but yes, uh, in terms of what the company actually does in terms of services for its customers, uh, these are some of the few things. Um, so what does Luno do? Uh, first and foremost, we actually operate a wallet. So uh, anytime you think about cryptocurrencies, you actually have to have somewhere where you store your cryptocurrencies. So effectively, we have a wallet that facilitates the storage of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, as well as it facilitates transactions. So basically, any buying and selling uh, also takes place on the wallet itself. So you can just imagine if you're familiar with any e-wallet, whether you're in Malaysia, whether you're in Myanmar, whether you're in the UK, um, you can just imagine it's pretty much like an e-wallet, but that e-wallet basically runs on the blockchain and interacts with the blockchain, which is the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies itself. Then otherwise also we have the exchange, which is a bit more sophisticated. So if you're familiar with any stock market out there, um, we do have an exchange platform, which basically allows uh, people to basically place orders. This is a bit more sophisticated in the sense that you need to have some familiarization with how exchanges work in terms of how to place an order, how to wait for an order to be filled, um, and you know uh, a few more things on the technical side. But also, uh, one of the things that we're doing today, uh, actually, is we're going to be learning and we're going to be discussing about cryptocurrencies. And we emphasize learning very much to um, anyone that is on our platform or actually everyone in general that wants to get into cryptocurrencies. Uh, reason being is because obviously as an asset class that has only been around for about 11, 12 years, we feel it's very important to kind of emphasize on the knowledge part, right? You have to be an informed investor. You have to be informed whether or not um, you're going to be putting your money uh, into something, especially if you're going to be uh, you know, trading actively. Um, we might actually come across some topics, uh, some questions in terms of Dogecoin, in terms of meme coins and, and stuff like that. So uh, for us, we, is, we very much emphasize and ensure that people are able to learn on our platforms. And you can actually do so via the learning portal. We also have a very in-depth blog. Uh, and also you can find us on various social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and the likes. Um, and also at the same time, we also offer a storage solution for more institutional uh, clients who actually want to kind of, uh, I guess, not have to deal with the burden of being able to secure the cryptocurrencies that they actually own, right? So assuming you'd like to store cryptocurrencies with us, we do have a storage solution. Uh, and it's actually securely stored via sophisticated and layered security processes and procedures. Um, one thing to note, 
um, typically that, that comes to mind, uh, people always ask me, where are our cryptocurrencies stored? Is it safe? Um, that's something that we will kind of cover later on during the session itself. Um, and another thing to note also, I think accessibility is very important. So something to, to kind of share with everyone in terms of where we're available on, you can find us on web, on mobile web, Android and iOS as well. So uh, assuming you have a device that actually has the ability to open a web browser, you should be able to find us there. And also at the same time, just a quick shameless plug. I just want to shout out the amazing people that I get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are some of the, in the, of the individuals, both past and present that I've actually had the privilege to be able to work with. Um, it's a very international team. So as I mentioned just now, um, we actually have, uh, I think, uh, so sorry, uh, we're based in 40 markets. So we operate uh, and actually offer our services in 40 markets. In terms of where the offices are based, uh, they're basically across all the four continents uh, in eight countries. Um, and then also at the same time, in terms of our nationalities, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, we easily have 80 plus nationalities on, on the team itself. So it's a very diverse team um, and they come from different backgrounds in, in the sense that, you know, some of them are from the financial institutions, some of them from financial markets, consulting, the tech sector, oil and gas, engineering, uh, even the law industry, right? So we have a, a very diverse uh, a group of people um, in terms of the team itself. But also, uh, just a quick, uh, I guess, history in terms of uh, what Luno is all about and also uh, where, uh, where the team was kind of developed and, and things like that. Um, just a quick, quick sharing session is just one slide, I promise. Um, but basically, um, our founders built Luno from uh, back then in 2013. Um, so two of them, one of them is Timothy and then the other is Marcus. They are both our CTO and CEO respectively. Uh, Timothy actually spent some time at Google, so uh, his background is basically um, in theoretical physics, uh, and then he runs most of the technological aspects when it comes to Luno itself. Well, as Marcus has actually had an extensive experience in uh, the financial markets and financial institutions. Um, so um, he has some certifications as well, CFA and MBA and CA. Um, and in terms of the rest of the team, some of the companies that we actually come from, uh, some, as I mentioned just now, Timothy was from Google, uh, another a member of our team was actually from Google as well. We have people from the consulting industry, the bank, so on and so forth. Um, but actually last year, this is something that we're quite proud of. We were actually fully acquired by the Digital Currency Group. So they're actually one of the largest investors in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. So uh, they felt they wanted uh, a cryptocurrency exchange in their portfolio and they decided to fully acquire us. And then, as I mentioned just now, our HQ actually is in London. Uh, we have offices in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Australia, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Johannesburg. Yeah, so we're, we're pretty sp uh, spread out in that sense. And uh, actually, eventually, we will be launching uh, somewhat on the left as well of that particular map uh, in the near future. So uh, in terms of today, I think we, whenever we talk about cryptocurrencies, we also need to kind of examine the current financial system, right? So the current financial system very much you know, has been around for, for decades and actually centuries at the same time. And it was pretty much, uh, we feel, was built for a non-digital age. And we can kind of, I kind of see already like there's some disruption happening in the particular space, right? So, uh, banks are very much looking to, to fintech solutions. Um, the existing hedge funds are also looking to um, fintech solutions at the same time. So um, a lot of things is, are happening in the space. But again, whenever we talk about finance, I think one word that starts with M comes to mind. And the word I'm talking about is money. So we're going to quickly visit in terms of how money has evolved throughout the years since its inception. Uh, but the funny thing is the money that we know it today is very different than the money that uh, we know since it first came into its inception, right? So way back when, once upon a time, our ancestors actually relied on the barter system. So um, if you're not familiar what that is, basically it's just exchanging uh, goods for another good. So it could, a typical example could be you exchanging uh, five chickens for one goat, right? So um, the problem with the barter system is assuming you don't want one whole gold. Maybe you just want uh, a quarter of a gold or you want just a leg of a gold or you just want the hide or something like that um, or, the, or the skin. How do you make that transfer without actually uh, quote unquote diluting the actual uh, good that you're actually exchanging, right? 
So that's one of the typical problems of the butter system. Uh, similarly, also say, for example, uh, if you have five chickens, what makes you decide that five chickens is worthy of one goat? So the valuation problem is also an issue, right? Next thing is eventually we decided we want to uh, move on towards stones, shells, and skins. Um, again, here, this is quite interesting because we solved a few problems with the butter system. But the thing is, at the same time, how do you decide that this stone is more valuable than this stone, right? So you can just go to the beach, you can just take a stroll in the park, and then you, you stumble upon a stone and you decide that this stone is worth five goats. Who is going to question you against that particular decision, right? Um, and then also at the same time, we have an issue of uh, the ability of shells, like perhaps uh, these shells are quite brittle and they might not actually uh, stand the test of time. So uh, again, you know, we, we decided to switch to something else. And I think this one is something that we're very much familiar with. Uh, and that is coins, right? So um, basically around the world, um, there were monarchs that decided that, you know, they wanted to print uh, their faces on their coins. So Malaysia very much still has that. Uh, the UK also has that. I'm assuming Myanmar also has that. Um, and pretty much the only issue with coins is, the thing is, it's heavy, right? So how are you going to lug around 1 million coins uh, from point A to point B? Um, and how can you do it in the best way possible? So that's the problem of, I guess, transferability, the ability to move uh, a large amount of coins that weigh a lot, right? And then we decided we wanted to switch to notes. This very much, I think we're all familiar, paper notes, plastic notes. Um, but there's still obviously some problems there as well. But I think uh, in the 1970s, eventually uh, we prior to that were on the gold standard, which means uh, what that means is basically anytime you have money in the form of coins or notes, you can go to the bank, your central bank, and be able to change that coins or notes for a respective amount in equivalent to gold, right? Um, and then 1970s, President Nixon actually decided that he wanted to stop that. Um, so then there was something called cent uh, central bank issued money or bank issued money, right? So this is the ability for the central banks around the globe to basically decide how much money they're going to print. And then that basically has an impact on inflation and deflation itself. Then uh, eventually, once we moved from the physical world, we started to use something called digital money. I think this, again, everyone is very familiar with it. I think we interact with it more than the physical notes we do today because all of us are stuck at home. So we're paying with our credit cards, we're paying with our banking accounts, right? So all you're seeing is just ones and zeros being interchanged from accounts, but there's no physical element of it. But I think where we're gonna be uh, talking about today the most is basically decentralized cryptocurrency. So it kind of looks at all of those elements and we feel very much that it kind of um, takes all the advantages of them and then also kind of um, looks into possibilities of fixing some of the um, disadvantages, right? So the topic today is very much decentralized cryptocurrency. So when you think about cryptocurrency, there's usually one word that comes to mind. It's typically Bitcoin. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Bitcoin because very much it's actually one of the world's most established cryptocurrencies. It's been around the longest uh, since 2009. Then, you know, it started to reach um, uh, the mainstream press uh, several times. I think 2011, there was a time it did as well. 2013, it did. Um, I think 2017, it did. And then I think more recently, because of all the headlines in terms of the financial institutions, the hedge funds, um, the very, uh, I guess, famous thought leaders and speakers in the investing space, they also have started to speak about crypto, at least last year and this year. So we're seeing a lot of things happening in the space as well. But in terms of Bitcoin, specifically in terms of what, how it works and what kind of uh, goes on in the background, there are a few things. So first thing to note about cryptocurrencies, other than the fact that it's actually the world's most established cryptocurrency, um, uh, sorry, Bitcoin in terms of uh, the most established cryptocurrency, is basically Bitcoin doesn't require an intermediary to be able to facilitate the transactions um, between uh, person to person, right? And the fact is, is because it is actually fully peer to peer. So what that means is if any of you are familiar with um, P2P platforms like uh, LimeWire, like BitTorrent of the like, so uh, I'm not advocating their use uh, whatsoever, but I'm just saying if you're familiar with those platforms in terms of file sharing, then you can kind of imagine the same thing here. And that analogy is something that can be used. So you can imagine that it's actually facilitated uh, without a central authority. And also at the same time, what kind of facilities that on the technological side, right? 
So it's also another word that starts with B and it's basically the blockchain. Uh, the blockchain is actually something very simple. It is just a method of storing data. So anytime someone tries to tell you a convoluted answer of what the blockchain is, you can just tell them, hold on, hold on, hold on. Actually, the blockchain is just a method of storing data. Specifically for Bitcoin's blockchain, uh, it's actually a record of all Bitcoin's transactions and it's stored on a ledger. So if any of you are in the uh, accounting uh, industry or the finance industry, you'll be familiar in terms of a ledger is basically a method of book bookkeeping in the sense that you're basically writing down uh, transaction A happened, it went from account A to account B, uh, but basically you can just imagine that it's a bookkeeping uh, method, right? And it's also known as the blockchain itself. Uh, but the only difference between, I guess, uh, regular bookkeeping or you know, uh, any accounting ledgers that you might have uh, the blockchain is actually stored online. Um, and uh, in addition to that, it is also immutable and decentralized, right? So what I mean by something when I mentioned that it's immutable, well, pretty simply put, it just means that you can only add to it and you can't remove anything from it. So what that means is, can you just imagine your, uh, your bookkeeping book? You're basically using a permanent marker and you are writing on that particular book itself. So it's not possible for you to remove that. You can't just strike it out or you can't blank that particular uh, written transaction that you've written using the marker pen. It basically will stay there forever and no one can remove it no matter what. And the fact is also at the same time, it is decentralized. So what that means is basically, uh, as I mentioned just now briefly, there's no central authority figure that controls it. So you can imagine all around the world, Wherever you are, um, the blockchain is exactly the same. So Bitcoin's blockchain, no matter where you are, whether you're in the UK, you're in Malaysia, you're in Myanmar, um, if you view the blockchain using uh, your, your internet browser, you will be basically seeing everything in the same, at the same time, in real time, no matter where you are in the world. Um, and the thing about the, the fact that it's decentralized, it's also somewhat a good thing. Reason being is because there's no single point of failure. So assuming something is centralized, that means that say, for example, in the unfortunate circumstance that is actually compromised or is hacked, then you would actually have a huge headache on your hands because that means there's only one central source. If that particular source goes or that particular uh, central authority goes, then you will have mass chaos and basically everyone else is impacted because it's all centralized. But also um, just kind of visualize what that looks like for everyone. Um, when you think about decentralization, you can just imagine that around the globe, there are a network of computers, right? So these networks of computers, as I mentioned just now, when it comes to the blockchain, because it's transparent and it's on the internet, everyone actually has the same copy of data, right? So the typical analogy I use here is let's imagine we're back in uh, primary school or secondary school. We all have our report cards. I think we all remember report cards. Um, for, for some, I think uh, they were definitely physical. For me, very much they were. So my physical report card was just a piece of paper, right? So can you imagine with decentralization, with the blockchain, that would mean that your report card is basically spread and kind of uh, distributed to all the important people in your life that should view your report card. So say, for example, your guardian, your parents, uh, anyone that is important to you that has uh, I guess the ability to, to be your, your guardian in that sense, uh, they will have real-time access to your report card, including your teachers, right? And your teachers will be able to update those report cards the minute your exam results actually are released. So uh, for some people that may, might not be too good, uh, like for me, you know, there were times where I failed a few grades, right? So that would mean that I couldn't change anything on my physical report card on that piece of paper. I couldn't uh, put some liquid paper or, you know, try to, to mark it off and everything and change the grade, uh, that's not possible whatsoever, right? So I think that's just something to note and that's a typical analogy that would use itself. But, you know, now we've covered the technology, we've shared a bit in terms of what it is, uh, we also want to talk about how it works in action itself, right? Because I think that's why all of you are here today, you all want to know how it works in, uh, in reality itself, right? So one example we always give is we typically use uh, interbank transfer as a, as a usual example. So let's imagine you have two people, you have Alice on the left and you have Bob on the right. So Alice is over in Malaysia. She wants to transfer funds to the UK. 
how is she going to do that? And typically, uh, if she's a, a, a regular person, typically uses uh, the, the, the financial system, the traditional financial system, she will basically be asking her bank, how can I transfer money from Malaysia to the UK? So the bank will tell her, okay, so here's what you do. Um, you might have to verify your identity. You might have to physically actually come to the bank or actually allow us to, to make this particular transfer. And you would basically need to verify it yourself, right? So um, here's what you're going to see. Uh, bank A basically shows on Bank A's ledger that Alice's account was deducted 100, let's say, ringgit, and it was transferred to Bank B, which belongs to Bob. Well, Bob's bank, uh, Bank B, basically has a ledger themselves, and it shows that um, Bank A, which is Alice's bank, is deducted of 100 ringgit, and then it was transferred to Bob's uh, bank account. So the thing about this is typically when it comes to interbank transfers, I think some of you may know if you have, typically have to transfer funds abroad, uh, it usually takes a bit longer. Um, you know, it sometimes takes business days, anywhere from one to three business days. So, and the reason why that is, is also because that there are multiple central authorities uh, being part of the process, right? So they're all intermediaries. So bank A, which belongs to, to Alice, that's intermediary one, and then bank B, intermediary two, which belongs to Bob, right? So Typically, it takes longer, um, and it's also usually a bit costlier compared to uh, using the blockchain itself. Well, if I want to show you how a Bitcoin transfer, how it works, uh, very much similar. Alice has a wallet instead of a bank account. And again, on Alice's ledger on her wallet, it shows that she transferred 100 ringgit uh, over to Bob. Right, so it doesn't matter where Alice is, Alice is, and it doesn't matter where Bob is, right? So wherever they are in the world, irrespective of their physical geolocation, they can actually transfer funds to each other, and it'll cost just the same in terms of if you're doing a, a domestic transfer, as long as it's on the, the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So it doesn't matter where they are in the world, they're making a transfer. One thing that you're going to see different here is in the middle itself, you will see all these transactions happening, right? So it's actually the same transaction, but remember the, the decentralized blockchain that I showed you just now? What's happening here is all of them are basically confirming that Alice's wallet transferred 100 ringgit to Bob's wallet, right? So this is basically the, the utility of decentralization because you're able to spread the risk. At the same time, you're able to verify transactions without the need of a central authority without trust. So typically people always say that the blockchain or Bitcoin's blockchain is a trustless system, right? So it doesn't mean that there's no trust. It doesn't mean, it just means that trust is typically taken out of the equation because of how the blockchain is programmed. And as I mentioned just now, you can basically transfer wherever you are in the world and it can take as uh, quick as 60 minutes. So one hour is a lot faster than uh, any business day, right? And also typically the cost is a lot cheaper as well. So currently for Bitcoin transfers, you actually only need to pay about um, 25 cents in US dollars. Um, so that's about one ringgit. Um, and yeah, so, you know, uh, that's a lot cheaper. Uh, I know typically if you use something like Western Union, transfer-wise, it's usually uh, at least, from my memory, I think it's, it'll be at least two digits US dollars, right? So at least 10 US dollars or, or the likes, right? But that's a lot more expensive than a Bitcoin transaction. So. And then also, I think um, if you can kind of uh, think about today's session itself when it comes to Bitcoin, if I leave you with just three takeaways, uh, I will feel great. You know, you can just use these three takeaways. Anytime someone asks you about Bitcoin, you can kind of just use this to explain it, right? So the first thing is typically Bitcoin is usually compared to gold. Reason being is because it is in limited in supply and also it's divisible, right? So it's easily divided into decimal points uh, like gold is in terms of you can liquefy the gold and you can weigh how much uh, that gold is in terms of that, right? Um, so when I say limited supply, uh, Bitcoin actually only has 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be mined or basically ever in circulated uh, in the market cap itself. Uh, and obviously the fact that it's divisible is good because as a store of value, as a method of, um, I guess, uh, interchanging funds as well, you will need the ability to kind of have that divisibility at the same time. So two things, limited supply, divisible. Second thing, it, as I showed you the example just now, it very much works like a payment method. Uh, just the fact that it's easier, it's faster and cheaper in some circumstances and typically most circumstances. And then the next thing, because it is actually powered by the blockchain, it's very much similar to the internet because there's no central authority. 
and it is actually available for anyone that has access to the internet as well as has a smart device like a smartphone, a tablet, or even a computer itself. So now we've kind of discussed um, the technology in terms of the backend, how it works. We kind of show you a quick example at the same time in terms of Bitcoin on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, what do most people actually use Bitcoin for, right? So uh, today we're actually going to cover mainly the middle part, which is mainly for investment purposes. Uh, also somewhat we're going to look at uh, active trading at the same time. So this is the need to greed index. Uh, we can kind of see that very much it is in the middle portion at this current juncture, but actually more and more use cases around the world, you're kind of seeing that people are using it for transactions uh, internationally. So um, wherever you are in the world, you can just make a transfer at the same time. So uh, as I mentioned just now, because we're going to be mainly covering investments, uh, we're going to be looking at Bitcoin as an asset class, right? And whenever you think about asset class, you always think about price. So the first question that comes to most people's minds are, or is, sorry, um, what determines the price of Bitcoin? Uh, does it have intrinsic value? Is it purely extrinsic value? Um, but I think uh, it's actually quite simple to answer in the sense that Bitcoin itself is very much the price is determined by supply and demand. So it's similar to the stock market, right? Um, in a sense that when you think about supply and demand, obviously there are a few more variables there. Um, you know, there are things like use cases in terms of the actual cryptocurrency, does it serve a purpose? Uh, there are things like regulations and taxation at the same time. I think recently uh, China has, has done a lot in that part in the sense that the country has decided to ban um, Bitcoin mining or mining in general, um, and then also technological developments, right? So um, similar to the use case, what is happening in the space that actually provides real world utility and how can we actually use it uh, in our day-to-day -day lives? Then also you have capital controls, but um, I think uh, very much China is also a, a big example of that because they have a lot of capital flight and they always place uh, a lot of capital controls in place to ensure that the UN or the renminbi actually uh, doesn't exit the country itself. But yeah, I mean, just really quick, those are some of the factors in terms of determining the price of Bitcoin itself. At the same time, um, when you think about price, you think about investment, you always think about returns. So um, usually when it comes to cryptocurrencies, when it comes to Bitcoin, there is a potential for high return. So uh, I want to focus on the word potential because again, um, I think it's important to know when did you enter the market? When did you uh, decide to invest? I think that's also very important. Uh, but some interesting stats for all of you to kind of know, um, there's actually been a study that has been done that shows that if you have invested in Bitcoin for at least four years, your portfolio or your investment will likely be profitable. I think it's like a 90 plus percent chance. Um, so uh, for, for you who actually have a longer time horizon in terms of investing in Bitcoin, or maybe you want to decide to do so for uh, the companies or organizations you, you represent, uh, to hold Bitcoin as a hedge or on your balance sheets, it's something you might consider as well. Um, but also you just need to remember in terms of what are your objectives, because uh, different people, different organizations, they have different objectives in terms of getting into cryptocurrencies itself. But also when you think about uh, price, when you think about valuation, you think about the potential for high returns, we always typically talk about market cap. So market cap is basically, um, the collective amount of funds that are actually investing or circulating in that particular cryptocurrency or uh, in this particular case, uh, it's Bitcoin itself, right? So um, in its entirety, cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, um, are actually, the last I checked yesterday, it's actually 10 trillion uh, ringgit Malaysia, right? So in terms of market cap globally, right? Um, so that's, that's relatively a large amount, um, but I will show you something in the next slide that will kind of maybe uh, make you do a bit more thinking in terms of Bitcoin as an asset class itself as well. So we've seen uh, consistent growth in terms of value as well as demand because market cap is usually used to um, gauge demand since the exception, inception of Bitcoin in 2009 itself. So um, you can see that there are more people getting involved in it, including institutions itself, not just retail investors. But also, uh, as I mentioned just now, because we feel since cryptocurrencies have only been around since 2009, they are very much viewed to be an emerging asset class. 
And we feel there is actually huge upside potential for individuals and businesses globally. If you kind of use Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies scaled to traditional asset classes itself. So just to kind of show you what I'm talking about, Bitcoin specifically, um, based on uh, data on the 26th of August, actually has a 5 trillion uh, ringgit market cap. Cryptocurrencies, as I mentioned just now, uh, as of yesterday, it's actually 10 trillion ringgit. But compared to some mainstay asset classes, let's kind of show you what that looks like, right? So gold actually has a 49 trillion ringgit market cap, whereas global equities, the global equities market actually has uh, last time I checked, the 391 trillion plus minus in ringgit market cap, right? So if you can kind of just compare, um, keep in mind stock markets have actually been around since the 16 or 1700s. Uh, if my memory serves me right, um, that was way back, uh, way, way, way back. So there's like 300, 400 years since the stock market has been around. Whereas Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have only been around for 12, right? So as an asset class, uh, we definitely believe that cryptocurrencies have very much room to grow. But uh, don't just let me tell you that. Um, let's kind of look at some uh, typical financial analysis um, and measurements that people use, especially when it comes to hedge funds and traditional investors. So just now I mentioned potential for high returns. I can show you something called the Sharpe ratio, right? So investors typically look for assets with a high return, but low correlation to the rest of the portfolio. This is assuming they want a very diversified portfolio. Um, and in, in Bitcoin's instance, it actually offers both. So Bitcoin actually has a higher sharp ratio compared to the traditional markets. Um, and the sharp ratio is basically measuring the performance of an investment compared to a risk-free asset, such as US treasuries, adjusting for its risk, right? So the idea is you want to have high returns, but low correlation to the rest of your portfolio. And you want to ensure that your portfolio is risk adjusted, adjusted and has the best risk management, assuming it's diversified. So the higher ratio, the better. Um, and just to kind of show you an example, the largest hedge fund in the world, uh, Bridgewater, which actually uh, was, a, was a brainchild of Ray Dalio, has a sharp ratio of 1.48 for its all-weather portfolio. So this all-weather portfolio is actually designed to perform well in all market conditions, right? So I think that's, a, that's something that any investor would want. So regardless of whatever economical condition uh, or situation that we're in, COVID, no COVID, bull market, bear market, you want to make sure that your portfolio is actually performing well or relatively well, right? Regardless of whatever the circumstance. And uh, the sharp ratio of Bridgewater's all-weather portfolio is actually 1.48. Um, where else the sharp ratio um, for Bitcoin um, is actually three, right? So remember just now I mentioned the higher sharp ratio, the better. So if you can kind of compare the largest hedge fund is all where the portfolio has a sharp ratio of 1.48, whereas Bitcoin has three, which is a lot better. It's actually twice, uh, two times uh, better than uh, the all weather portfolio itself for Bridgewater. Um, so that's kind of just give you an idea um, uh, in terms of some typical measures that people use in the financial markets itself. Then the next thing is in terms of correlation, because I mentioned correlation just now, you want to make sure that in a diversified portfolio, all your assets are not tied to each other, right? So that means you want to ensure that some assets actually have a lower correlation compared to other assets. And when you look at Bitcoin, it actually has the average absolute lowest correlation compared to the other asset classes like gold, bonds, commodities, crude oil, as the indexes like S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, uh, so on and so forth, right? So over the past three years, Bitcoin actually has the lowest correlation compared to the other assets, as I mentioned just now. And again, investors want to look for consistent, uncorrelated assets to improve their risk-adjusted returns. Um, and then something to note, obviously, in March 2020, we had a huge sell-off in all markets. But actually, Bitcoin was relatively uncorrelated or the lowest, uh, had the lowest correlated compared to other um, asset classes itself. And just to kind of show you how Bitcoin, again, compares to um, some of the other indexes uh, in terms of the, the markets, the financial markets across the globe, um, this is a bit more uh, in terms of that. So again, it had the lowest average absolute um, correlation compared to the other assets, as I've kind of shown here itself. 
But um, again, don't let me stop there. Um, it's also important to note that, as I mentioned just now earlier on, more and more institutional investors are actually warming up to Bitcoin. And just going to show you, uh, over the next decade, actually, we feel very much cryptocurrencies will impact everybody's lives, whether indirectly or directly itself, right? So uh, very much, we still feel that the opportunity is enormous. Uh, and this is just to kind of show you some headlines that have gone around in the news um, of, of, uh, of late, specifically JP Morgan's CEO's views on, on Bitcoin itself. So in, back in 2017, uh, Jamie Dimon said that Bitcoin is a fraud and will eventually blow up. Um, I think in the article his, itself, he also mentioned that if any of JP Morgan's um, employees actually offered Bitcoin as an asset class to any of these, any of the JP Morgan clients, uh, they would actually be fired, right? So uh, 2017, very, very, very against cryptocurrencies, against Bitcoin. But just three years, you can see now JP Morgan is uh, somewhat eating their, their own words, right? So they're actually starting to warm up. They've already offered banking solutions to cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase, Gemini. And then also now JP Morgan is saying that Bitcoin has considerable upside and is better, uh, competes with gold as an alternative currency, right? So uh, big start changes when it comes to some of the mainstays in the financial institution space, uh, especially when it comes to the banks. A uh, few more headlines just to kind of show you um, slightly uh, later, and I will kind of share some reports also at the same time. But in terms of uh, institutional interest, sorry. Um, so these are just some of the companies uh, around the world, uh, public listed companies that have actually decided to put Bitcoin uh, on their balance sheets. So they've decided to use Bitcoin um, as a hedge against inflation, against the devaluation of their own local currency, uh, their fiat currency, in this case, for, for most of these companies, uh, is actually the US dollar. So MicroStrategy is a big one. Um, I think that particular company has come up a lot because its CEO is a huge advocate for Bitcoin. Um, then also, you know, you have uh, companies like Square Inc. So Square Inc. is actually uh, the parent company of Twitter, right? So obviously Twitter is a huge company. Um, as I mentioned just now, a lot of people rely on Twitter for news, for things happening around the globe, uh, for updates and stuff like that. So uh, those are the main two mainstay companies. I think recently uh, PayPal um, announced that they're gonna start offering UK customers the ability to buy and sell cryptocurrencies using their platform. Um, so yeah, PayPal is a huge name. You know, they've been around for the longest time, you know, facilitating remittances, payments and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it just goes to show that more and more companies are actually warming up to the idea of Bitcoin, warming up to the idea of cryptocurrencies. And then another typical, uh, I guess, uh, fun fact that we'd like to share with everyone is basically um, this. And what this is, is basically, uh, this is a slide that kind of shows Grayscale, which is the largest provider of trust funds to invest in digital assets. Uh, so usually Grayscale is used as a barometer of institutional interest. Reason being is because mainstay companies, the ones with, which are you know, public listed, have board of directors, you know, have non-executive directors and stuff like that. Usually um, there's a lot of red tape when it comes to approving additional asset classes or even to hold additional assets on the balance sheets. So typically institutions, they actually take the easy way or the, the quickest way, um, even though actually it costs them a lot more because the, their fees associated with this, right? Um, they decide to buy into Grayscale's fund uh, or Bitcoin fund, right? Um, and as of uh, two days ago, or actually yesterday, if you uh, just take into account the, the time difference, um, their total asset under management was basically 46.8 billion US dollars. So that means there are about 46.8 billion US dollars that have come in from institutional investors that have decided that they want to invest in Bitcoin, but they don't have the best way to do so. So they do it via this fund. So this kind of goes to show that they're willing to pay more money in terms of fees to be able to get into an asset like Bitcoin versus acquiring it themselves, uh, at least at an organizational level. So uh, why is that, right? So I think it's something that everyone should ask themselves. Is it something that we're missing or are these institutions actually on to something itself? So I mentioned some further reading. I mentioned some reports. Um, these are the ones you can kind of refer to. Um, again, I think the slides will be shared with you uh, by the BMCC team. Um, and, you know, these are just some reports that we typically refer to. 
Um, Bloomberg themselves actually have their own crypto department now, so you can look them up just to kind of see what they're saying about crypto. They're actually very active on Twitter at the same time. So uh, when you get the slides, you'll be able to click these links and then you can kind of see what they are all about. But basically the reports are on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general itself. Okay, so um, next quick bit. I think obviously you, you might be asking uh, digital assets or is Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies actually legal in Malaysia? So we'll just quickly cover in terms of regulations because as I mentioned just now, um, Luno as a platform, we are a regulated digital asset exchange in Malaysia. Uh, so I think I may have given away uh, the answer already. So very much cryptocurrencies in Malaysia are legal. So it is not illegal to own, trade, buy, sell Bitcoin. And uh, in terms of the institutions that we report to, uh, one of them is actually Bank Negara Malaysia, so the Central Bank of Malaysia. Uh, we are a reporting institution to them and we ensure that none of our customers are involved in money laundering and you know, terrorist financing because I think that those are two big issues when it comes to financing, uh, when it comes to, to money in general. So uh, if you look up the anti-money laundering and counter financing of terrorism policy for digital currency sector six, uh, you can see how uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin itself actually uh, plays into that and how we as an exchange ensure that none of our customers are involved in that particular aspect. And then in terms of our main regulators, the people that we report to very much, it is the Securities Commission. So the reason why we report to the Securities Commission in Malaysia is because cryptocurrencies are viewed as a securities by law. So if you look up the capital markets and services prescription of securities, digital currency, and digital token order 2019, you'll see how our cryptocurrencies and how digital asset exchanges uh, play into that. So the SC is put in place purely for the purpose to ensure that investors in Malaysia are basically safe and also are well taken after in terms of, you know, um, the, the platforms, they verify that the platforms are legitimate, they ensure that measures are in place to, to ensure the safety of customers' funds. So uh, the SC and, and Bank Negara play a, a very pivotal role in that aspect, uh, especially when it comes to something as new as cryptocurrencies. You know, there are a lot of scams uh, around when it comes to cryptocurrencies. So we definitely um, want to ensure that that is reduced or mitigated. Um, and then one thing you can kind of do to do that is basically ensure that you um, basically participate on a regulated exchange uh, and you make sure that you are an informed investor and trader as well. Uh, so this is just a quick headline. Uh, this is not coming from me, this is coming from Malay, uh, Malay, uh, Malay Mail in the sense just to show that Luno is very much fully approved. Uh, you can look up uh, the, the other news articles also just to verify whether that's the actual case. Uh, but yes, we basically received our full regulatory approval back in 2019. But I think some of you may be asking, uh, what's the easiest way to kind of get started, right? Assuming you don't want to do what uh, those customers of Grayscale have been doing, you don't want to pay exorbitant fees to be able to acquire cryptocurrencies, you actually can do so, sorry, uh, via these three means, right? So the easiest method is basically you can just receive it, assuming you might have some loss, long lost relative or, or family member, loved one that uh, got into cryptocurrencies, into Bitcoin a long, long time ago, and they have a lot of it, uh, you pretty much uh, can receive it, right? So just share your wallet address with someone and then they will send you cryptocurrency. So that's the easiest way. There's no monetary cost whatsoever. Uh, where else? Uh, the typical way that most of us do it um, is basically by uh, purchasing it or buying it. So um, you can actually uh, do so, and this is actually the easiest way to be able to acquire cryptocurrencies itself. And then the third, and uh, usually the one that uh, might make some Malaysian headlines in terms of the news is basically mining cryptocurrencies. So small caveat here, I just want to mention that the mining of cryptocurrencies is actually not illegal, but stealing electricity very much is. So the, the headlines you typically see in Malaysia, the reason why uh, the police are raiding these mining farms, these mining operators, is basically because the cryptocurrencies that they're mining, they're using illegal means of actually um, sourcing their energy, right? So they're stealing electricity from uh, the national um, power provider, which is TNB. So that's one thing you can consider, but I think ultimately you need to remember that mining Bitcoin is not illegal itself, and there are actually ways to kind of go upon it. So uh, four quick steps in terms of how you can kind of get started. First, you basically sign up on a regulated exchange if you're just starting out. 
then you got to verify your identity because as I mentioned just now, money laundering and terrorist funding is very much a thing. So we need to make sure you are who you say you are and your funds are legitimate and not in any way associated to any of these um, illicit activities. Next thing, just deposit money using your bank account into your Luno e-wallet. And then lastly, you'll be able to buy Bitcoin through the exchange or the wallet itself. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of a quick way to kind of get started. I'll just quickly show you what the Luno app looks like. This is what it looks like. Uh, as I mentioned just now, the learning portal is very much important to us. So it's, uh, it's always here in the tab at the bottom here. So you click the explore section, you'll be able to see this. You can learn, you can look at news, you can look at crypto in general, what's happening in the space as well. Uh, and yeah, so that's pretty much how the app looks like. Um, if you look us up on the web browser, it's slightly different at the same time. But I think all of you may be asking why is this important? Um, because from where we started in the beginning was basically about the financial system, right? So the idea is basically to reimagine the financial system. Um, how do you do that? Um, one method we feel is basically via decentralized cryptocurrencies um, that will help the world kind of upgrade to a better financial system. So again, similar like just now where Bitcoin had three main takeaways, I just want you to leave, with, leave this webinar with five main takeaways. First is cryptocurrencies actually enables money to be cheaper. What I mean by that is you'll be able to facilitate international remittance, a very much cheaper compared to the existing solutions. Next thing is the fact that it's faster. Who doesn't want money to be in their accounts quicker, right? If you ask me if I could um, jump forward to my salary day, I would do that anytime. I think everyone else would do the same as well. Um, but it also makes it safer um, in the sense that as long as you know how the technology works, you double check the address that you're, selling, you're sending the funds to. Um, it's very much a lot safer because it's actually secured by a cryptographic security. Next thing, as I mentioned, because it's done by the blockchain, so it's transparent and also private. Um, what that means is because the fact that the blockchain is viewed online, anyone can view it at any one time, right? So I think it's very, very important to kind of note at the same time. And it's private, uh, but I'm going to have a caveat there. So it's private in the sense that it is pseudonymous. So pseudonymous means that there is always one, I guess, identifier, it may be numbers. So you will always see on the blockchain that this number or this bank, I guess, account number is interacting with the blockchain, but you actually will not be able to tell who or what in terms of organization that that person or that organization is, right? But there's one thing, as I mentioned just now, there was a caveat. The thing is, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, a lot of people think that it's the best uh, means of crime. That's not true. Um, because it is pseudonymous, it's not anonymous, what it means is law enforcement agencies around the world have actually used Bitcoin as a method to trace scams, frauds, ransom. So if you ask me, Bitcoin is actually not the best method to be able to scam, fraud, or you know, uh, cheat people or hold a ransom or, or any of the sorts, right? Uh, Reason being is because law enforcement agencies have actually found the people who have used uh, Bitcoin as this method of, of uh, illicit activity. So if you're thinking that Bitcoin is good for crime, that is actually not true at all. Next thing is uh, the cryptocurrencies that uh, you kind of hear about are actually controllable and programmable in the sense that you can actually make changes to the particular blockchain in terms of how the programming works, right? But um, it's important to note that anytime this is done, it actually has to, done, has to be done in a consensus mechanism. So everyone actually has to agree that this is the best way moving forward before something can be done. But it's important because like paper notes, you can't actually program it, right? You can't say, hey, paper note, when uh, person A passes away, please send your value to person B, right? That's not possible with a paper note because it's tangible, it's physical. Well, else you can do so with actually uh, using cryptocurrencies. And then lastly, uh, we feel that cryptocurrencies are actually very much an open and equal and equal access for everyone, assuming you just have access to the internet. And also, um, you know, you have a platform to be able to buy and sell cryptocurrencies. Uh, anyone can use it, assuming you have those two things, including the internet itself. So yes, uh, that's all from me. Um, I hope it was useful for everyone. And I know we might have some q and I actually have not been looking at the chat box. Um, so yeah, uh, Daniel, over to you. Thank you so much, Arif, for very, very insightful uh, thoughts about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular. 
Um, yeah, we, we have only about 10 to 15 minutes time, but we do have quite a number of questions, uh, but quite a number of those are operational for Luno, and I think uh, Arif probably could answer them uh, via the chat uh, later on. Uh, just very quickly, because we're talking about investments, right, and I'm sure you mentioned that uh, security is uh, uh, something that's very important and, and something that cryptocurrency is, is, is secure. So, but uh, have we have any incidents of like cyber attacks or that data leakages that has caused uh, people losing, investors losing their, their uh, investments? And, and is there a guarantee that the current currency stolen will be recovered? Uh, how about? Okay, uh, great question, Daniel. Uh, in terms of security, um, I think one thing to note is uh, touch wood, Luno has actually never been compromised. We have never been hacked. Um, so that's something that we're very much proud of. Um, we've been around since 2013. So that means uh, eight years, if my math serves me correctly, in terms of not being compromised, not being uh, hacked. In terms of data leakages, also very much the same thing. Um, in terms of insurance, uh, or you know what happens if, say, for example, customers' funds are, are stolen and stuff like that, I think it depends on specific circumstances. Um, I, the typical analogy that I use is if you own a landed residence and you leave your front door open at 3 a.m., do you blame the police authorities or you blame yourself? Right? So uh, what, why, you, why I use that analogy is because customers also have some responsibility when it comes to securing their accounts. Right? You cannot be lackadaisical when it comes to passwords, when it comes to uh, leaving your devices in like in areas uh, which you may may not be able to monitor and stuff like that. So uh, in terms of best practices, we actually do have best practices and recommendations to customers in terms of how they can ensure that their cryptocurrencies are stored securely. Um, we have um, you know no qualms of also sharing with customers. They can actually um, what's the word? Uh, utilize different methods of storing the cryptocurrencies if they decide to self custody. That's also something that's possible. So that means you can transfer your cryptocurrencies that you've bought or transferred to Luno to an external wallet, which is what we call a hardware wallet. But again, hardware wallets have some advantages and disadvantages similar to if you store it on an exchange. Say, for example, I think some headlines people may be familiar with, there's actually a guy in the US that stored, I think, a thousand plus Bitcoin or a hundred plus Bitcoin on a hard drive and he misplaced that hard drive. So he basically is now uh, leading an effort to be able to search dumpsters or you know, where, where they kind of store all the rubbish to find his hard drive, to find the millions of cryptocurrencies that he has stored on that physical device. So there are pros and cons. Um, ultimately, I think for us, we very much uh, always tell customers to do their own due diligence. But also when it comes to security, only a minor amount of cryptocurrencies are stored on, online for Luno, right? So what that means is if someone who wanted to compromise Luno, they wanted to get to the majority of our funds, it is not possible to do so via the internet because it's not connected to the internet. So the majority of our funds are actually stored in a cold wallet, um, which is a, a, a basically a physical device uh, and also a deep freeze storage solution. So you can just imagine a bank vault, which has multiple um, you know, security checkpoints and only uh, specific people can access. Another thing also to note, um, all our wallets are multi-signatory, which means uh, you can imagine the password being split up to multiple people. So you can't just kidnap one person and expect the password to be with that one person and you'll be able to access the vault and, and the other wallets, right? You would need to be able to find multiple people, multiple organizations to be able to, to find out the full password, then you'll actually gain access to the wallets and the funds itself. So those are some of the measures we take, uh, we take and put in place. Um, and yeah, okay. so I think that's pretty much when it comes to security. Okay. Um, yeah, another question from Dr. Hamid actually, uh, yeah. looking at it from an economic point of view, you were talking that Bitcoin has no correlation with other assets, right? Because yeah. Uh, perhaps crypto does not have a direct link to real to a real economic sector. What would you have to say about that? Okay, I'm just reading the question. Can I can I just uh, confirm, Daniel? The question is in the chat, right? Not the Q and A. In the Q and A. Oh, the in the Q and A. Sorry. Okay. okay. 
Let me just see that. Uh, okay, low correlation with other asset because perhaps does not have a direct link to a real economy sector. What do you think? Okay, so the reason why I feel um, that might not necessarily be the case is because traditional financial markets and financial institutions are now getting involved in, in cryptocurrencies and uh, Bitcoin, right? So I would say it is very much, even though you can say that it's its own economic sector, it is linked to all these things. And you've got to keep in mind, investors typically have very diversified portfolios, right? So they could be hedging one asset for another asset. So everything can still be correlated, but despite it seem, seemingly be somewhat correlated, it actually has the lowest correlation. Um, so do I think that um, it has no direct link to the real economic sector? I would say no, because you're seeing real impact uh, in the world, right? So El Salvador decided to add Bitcoin as legal tender in their country. Um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are serving a purpose in uh, Venezuela, in Argentina, in Iran, in countries where their own central banks, their own governments have somewhat failed uh, the, the economic system and the, the financial system in the country itself. So, so I say actually there, there is very much, uh, there's still a, a link there somewhat. Okay. Um, thank you for that. So um, related to that question, um, you know, in a world of digital currency, right? Um, I'm sure there are many factors that influence uh, the, the value of, of this uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, for example, Bitcoin. Um, and we have heard in the past how a certain tweet by some influential in person could actually cause huge declines in the value. How, how do you actually make, minimize this kind of risk so, uh, so that you know, investors can take precaution? Yeah, so I think no doubt um, when it comes to regulations, so regulators actually play a very strong part there. Uh, the, the person that I think you're referring to, I think everyone knows who that is. Uh, I won't name names, but um, we have actually seen the regulators in the US actually take legal action against that particular person for his, uh, his comments that actually have led to the SEC thinking, uh, believing that there was some form of market manipulation, right? So it's not just when it comes to cryptocurrencies, but um, you know, this market manipulation or you know, these thoughts uh, expressed by uh, famous people actually have happened in other markets as well. So I think that the main difference is regulators play a role um, and they can step in and they have, they've actually issued fines to this particular individual. Um, but it's also important at the same time for investors to do their due diligence, to understand what they're investing in. Do not just invest in something because someone tells you it's great, right? So I urge all of you to do your own research. Don't just listen to my webinar today, this one hour that we spent together, right? Uh, do your research, find out what else is available, and then kind of be able to make a conscious decision and informed decision yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, do you think Bitcoin could be the source of the next financial crisis as governments and central banks are losing control of their uh, uh, losing their control on the economy and monetary policy because of cryptocurrency because it's decentralized? So I, I actually would, would kind of pose a, uh, an alternative view. Uh, reason being is if you um, look up some, some data, you'd actually find that um, some countries, um, specifically China, the country itself actually holds a portfolio of cryptocurrencies. So I don't think necessarily say, for example, uh, central banks or governments will, will, will think that um, they are being challenged to, to, to that point. In fact, even central banks and governments are actually looking to pilot uh, central bank digital currencies, right? CBDCs. Um, so I think what that kind of means is basically they're looking of how they can bridge the gap, how they can kind of uh, incorporate some elements of the blockchain or cryptocurrencies, but I think to be honest, um, uh, a personal opinion is the two can live aside one another. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a sense that one is, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess unseating the other or anything of the sort. Um, do I think that it can be the source of the next financial crisis? I think governments have to decide um, because I think uh, in an economical perspective, um, money printing does have some impacts on the general economy. Um, so they also you know, they need to make sure that they, they're doing their part to be able to 
reduce the burden on, on the population, on people in general, and to ensure that uh, it doesn't collapse, right? So um, governments have bailed out banks. Uh, I don't know whether they can bail out their own central bank because the central bank is the one that is, uh, you know, printing the, the money itself. But yeah, I think it's, it's a very long discussion that we can kind of have on that particular question. And it can, it can be very ideological also at the same time. Do you know if Malaysia is looking to uh, the central bank digital currency? Uh, because I think Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Thailand, and South Korea has piloted that. Do you know if Malaysia for, is doing Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Daniel. I think for, for Malaysia specifically, I think there was an article that was recently released. So Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, um, I think uh, the UK was also involved, um, if my memory serves me right. But uh, those banks are basically testing uh, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, for the purpose of uh, banking settlements. So it's not for the retail investor or retail user, but more on the large scale banking uh, banking side, right? Um, so yeah, I think it, it is something that they've looked into. I know um, one of the one of the uh, the central bank of malaysia um, the head of the innovation department he has mentioned that they are looking into it so they, they are looking at the use cases i think but they haven't decided particularly which particular area they're going to explore specifically okay one final question to you before we end this uh, very enlightening uh, session that we had uh, just as a closing remark as well, what advice would you have for business owners uh, who want to secure their financial assets through cryptocurrency and guarantee business continuity from enforcing global and regional crisis in the future? Okay, tough one. Um, so just another another disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. So this I, this may be you know not the, the best advice to get from me, but I think definitely in, in general, when it comes to um, the typical adage, um, if you spread if you spread your your risk, uh, I think that's always a good way to start, right? So, um, I think um, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, one of the famous investors, he basically says if you want to give Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies a shot, um, allocate maybe one to five percent of your overall portfolio, right? So, um, you can look at it as a small, minute amount. If there's great upside, then fantastic, right? Um, that means maybe one to 5% of your portfolio suddenly becomes 20%, 30% of your overall portfolio in terms of value. Um, but if it goes south, uh, if, you know, um, unfortunately it doesn't uh, actually turn out well, then you're only sacrificing or you're only putting one to 5% of your portfolio there. I think that's a good way to, to look at it. But I think ultimately you have to do your own research. You have to see what other people are doing. Um, you have to see what institutions are saying about, about cryptocurrencies, about Bitcoin. Um, maybe they're saying it because they have a short, they have shorted a position or they have a they long the position, right? So it might be for their vested interest as well. But I think ultimately the more information you have, the better able you are to be able to make an informed decision. So I think that's a good place to start. Okay, thank you so much, Arif, for sharing your uh, with us your input for today and We'd like to thank all the participants who are here as well today for joining us. And I hope that this session has broadened your views on cryptocurrency and its future opportunities. Um, I would like to also add that we have a survey link posted in the chat box. Please give us your feedback on today's webinar. Before we end, I would Daniel? like to highlight... Yeah. Uh, sorry, right. can I just ask? Because I, I know that there are a lot of questions that have gone unanswered. I'm just yes. wondering if there's any possibility for BMCC to maybe compile those questions. I can yes. answer them and then I can send them back to you. Can, we would okay. we'll do that. Sorry, sorry about that. Thanks, Daniel. No problem. Yeah, before we end, I would just like to highlight a couple of BMCC's upcoming events. First, we have the BMCC CEO Insights Series on 14th of September next week, 3 p.m., where Nick Chambers, the country head of Michael Page, will be speaking about leading through change. And I think this will be an interesting uh, session to hear from him how he has navigated the past 18 months, especially uh, throughout this pandemic. And we can have valuable insights on the employment outlook from that. So please register on the link showed on the screen. And the second one on the final week of October, from 25th to 29th October, we'll be uh, having a Malaysian uh, Climate Action Week organized by BMCC and the British High Commission uh, proceeding to the COP26 in Glasgow. So we are seeking to raise awareness about climate action among businesses, especially in Malaysia and the region, 
uh, around the topics of ESG, climate governance, energy transition, smart cities, food waste impacting climate change and decarbonizing supply chains. So do save the date and we will have more information shared with you in the coming weeks. So this brings our webinar today to an end. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you once again, Arif, for your insightful thoughts. Um, yeah, stay safe, take care, and have a wonderful week ahead. Goodbye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.